Hello and welcome to this Crash Course Guide on the Foundation Block. This series of videos will cover all of the following topics. However, today we're just going to focus on the basic principles of the Foundation Block, basic genetics and DNA and replication. Firstly, let's start with a few questions to test your knowledge before we begin. What type of inheritance does this family tree show? Is it autosomal recessive, dominant, X-linked recessive or no pattern at all? At this point, you can pause the video to give yourself more time to answer the questions, but we're going to zoom through it here because these videos are designed to be short. So the answer to this question is autosomal recessive. And the reason for this is because this inheritance pattern shows skipping a generation. And we'll discuss this a little bit more later on in the video. Question two, the four bases in RNA are what? Remember, one base is substituted between DNA and RNA. So the answer here is A, U, C, and G, and the reason for this is T, which is found in DNA, is swapped for U, which is uracil in RNA. And question three, which of the following is true for a neutrophil? Does it release toxins that kill or inhibit bacteria? Is it stored in the spleen? Is it part of the adaptive immune system? And are there five different types of neutrophil? So think about the immune response and what the role of a neutrophil is. And the answer is, it releases toxins that kills and inhibits bacteria. If you look at the other answers, you can see why they're incorrect by looking at this pink bubble up in the top right-hand corner. So let's start by looking at a few of the basic principles of the foundation block. So this is something that you'll have probably covered at A-level, and it's the four stages of cellular aerobic respiration. We start with glycolysis, which is an anaerobic process in the cytosol. We then go to the transition reaction, or the Lynx reaction as it's sometimes called then to the Krebs cycle, and finally to the electron transport chain, which occurs along the inner mitochondrial membrane and uses high energy electrons from NADH and FADH to create an electrochemical proton gradient which powers ATP synthesis. So the overall aim of this is to produce ATP. So first let's have a look at basic genetics. Of course we're all humans and what are we made up of? Well we're made up of cells which contain chromosomes which contain DNA. So over the course of this video, we're going to be taking a look at what that truly means. So a gene, this is the basic unit of genetic information and determines the inherited characteristics of an individual. The genome is the collection of all the genetic information and chromosomes are storage units of these genes. And then we break it down to DNA. So this is a nucleic acid that contains genetic instructions specifying the biological development of all cellular forms of life. So human cells all contain 46 chromosomes, and that can be broken up into 23 pairs. Now we can think of these as autosomes and sex chromosomes. So we have 22 pairs of autosomes, and then two sex chromosomes, and these can be either XY in males, or XX in females. And they look a little bit like this, and this is the human carrier type with 23 pairs of chromosomes. So chromosomes have a locus, and this is the location of a gene on the chromosome, and an allele, and that is one variant form of a gene at a particular locus. So these are key terms to be aware of when thinking about genetics, because it will help you understand the whole module. So this here is a chromosome, and to label it, these are two identical chromatids. In the middle, we have the centromere, and this is the part keeping the chromosome together. Then we have a Q-arm, which is the long arm structure, and a P-arm, which is the short arm structure. So thinking about genotype and phenotype when we come to genetics, the genotype at each locus there are two genes. So the expression of these determine the genetic makeup of a cell and an individual. And this in turn determines its characteristics, which in other words is its phenotype. So the genotype are the genes we have, say, to display an eye colour, but the phenotype is the actual eye colour that we see as a characteristic of an individual. So dominant and recessive, again, just more key terms. So a dominant allele is expressed even if it is paired alongside a recessive allele. And a recessive allele is only visible as a phenotype when paired with another recessive allele. Also key terms are heterozygote and homozygote. So a heterozygote is an individual with two different alleles of a given gene or locus. And homozygous is an individual with two identical forms of a given gene or locus. So we can see this here to check our understanding. So we have three different types of alleles here. 
uh, combinations of alleles and we can fit them into the boxes. So for example, this first one is heterozygous. The second one is homozygous dominant and the third one is homozygous recessive. This is because both of these alleles are dominant. They're both capital letters indicating dominance, and homozygous means the same. That therefore justifies why this is homozygous recessive, and this is heterozygous because both alleles are different. We have one dominant and one recessive. Mendel's laws are really important, and unfortunately they're just one of those things that you have to sit down and learn off by heart. So there's the law of dominance, law of segregation, and law of independent assortment. And these overall govern the appearance of an organism. So Punnett squares are really important to be able to read. So say we have a mum with blue eyes, which is recessive, so two lowercase b letters, and a dad with brown eyes, which is dominant. If we put this into a Punnett square, it'll look a little bit like this. And then if we put it all together, it looks like this. So the offspring is always going to have brown eyes, because brown eyes is dominant, but, the 90, but all of the time they'll also be carriers. Now this can look a little bit different when we mix it up a little bit. So for example, say the mother has blue eyes, which is uh, BB recessive, and the dad has brown eyes, which is now B dominant and B recessive, so heterozygous. The outcome will look a little bit different. So there's a 50% chance now of having blue eyes and a 50% chance of having brown eyes. In order to understand this a little bit more, create your own Punnett square and have a look at a few examples online and have a practice. So patterns of inheritance. There are several different types of inheritance patterns, or there could be no pattern to inheritance whatsoever. And these are we call Mendelian inheritance, and we're going to talk through them one by one. So first of all, autosomal recessive. This came up in the, start, in the quiz at the start, and we said that this disease skips generations. As you can see, it's here in the second generation and in the fourth. And the disease can affect both males and females equally, and children of unaffected parents are those that are affected. So both parents will be carriers, and the child has a 1 in 4 chance of being affected. An example of this is cystic fibrosis. Autosomal dominant appears in every generation. Again, it can affect both males and females equally, and the disease affects children of affected mothers or fathers. So it's passed on directly from the parents. And an example of this is Huntington's. Next we have X-linked recessive. Now more males than females show this disorder, and all the daughters of affected males are carriers. So when we see an affected male, we see um, daughters that are carriers. Sons of an affected male parent are completely unaffected. So here you can see this. So the male parent is affected here. These daughters would be carriers. So that's a slightly incorrect uh, shading there. But the males would be completely unaffected there. Um, so this example here is haemophilia. The reason for this is that the males are XY. Uh, in their genetic makeup, and they get their X from the mother and the Y from the father. So if it's an X-linked disorder, then it's not going to be able to be passed on from the father because the father is only giving a Y chromosome to the offspring. You can also have X-linked dominant. So affected males pass the disorder to all daughters. Affects males ne affected males sorry, never pass the disease to their sons. And affected heterozygote females and unaffected males pass the condition to half of their offspring. An example here is fragile X syndrome. These are less important to be able to spot on a pedigree diagram than the classic autosomal recessive and autosomal dominant. We also have co-dominance, and here the classic example of this is blood types A and B. And each allele makes a slightly different protein, but both alleles influence the phenotype of an individual. So mitochondrial inheritance, this applies to genes found in mitochondrial DNA only, and mitochondrial disorders can appear in every generation but they can affect males and females equally, but can only be passed on from the mother, not from the father. So DNA. The structure was discovered by Watson and Crick in 1953, and it's short for deoxyribonucleic acid. There are two complementary strands of bases in a double helix and a string of nucleotides attached to a sugar phosphate backbone. And there are four main base bases, and they're either pyrimidines or purines. Just to serve that in diagrammatic form, we have a deoxyribose, which is the sugar, added on to phosphates and cyclic amines, which is your base. So, base pairs. There are four main base pairs, and these are A, T, C, and G. Adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. 
And then we also have a fifth base pair, and this is uracil, but this is only displayed in RNA, ribonucleic acid, and not in DNA. And it replaces the T when DNA becomes RNA. So DNA looks a little bit like this. A pairs up with T, and C pairs up with G. They never change their base pairing. A is always with T, and C is always with G. In RNA, A is now with U, because the U is replaced with T, and C remains with G. So base pairing is complementary, so A, as we've said, is always with T, and C is always with G. And A and G are pyrimidine bases, and T and C are purines. And basically, a pyrimidine must always pair up with its complementary purine base. So as we've said, DNA is a double helix structure. And the sugar phosphate backbone is on the outside and holds everything in place. And the bases are on the inside and are joined together through their complementary base, by hydrogen bonds. So as you can see, the adenine is joined to thymine here, and cytosine are joined to guanine. So because the two strands are complementary, if you know one strand, you automatically know the other. And the strands are antiparallel, which means they're not identical. And we read strands in a 5 to 3 direction, and although this may seem a little confusing, all it means is we read it in a specific order. So A pairs up with T, T with A, G with C, A with T, C, and so on. We read it in a particular order, a particular way, and the base pairing must be complementary along the strand. So now let's take a quick look at DNA replication. So we know DNA's got two strands with identical information, and in order to replicate, i.e. make another copy of itself, it must open up and expose its unpaired bases and match perfectly to an alternative strand. So there are three models of replication. Firstly, semi-conservative. In other words, the strands split up and new strands form by reading each other. Alternatively, we can have conservative replication, so we make a copy of the double strand from the double strand without its splitting. And dispersive, so double helix breaking and reforming at random. And these three were hypotheses as to how replication occurs. We now know replication is semi-conservative, and this is due to an experiment that was done in the centrifuge. And you can look into this in a little bit more detail if you wish but all we know is that it is semi-conservative from this experiment. And so if mistakes occur, it's important for DNA to be replicated carefully because mistakes equals mutations and possibly cancer in the offspring. So, usually we have only one mistake in a billion nucleotides, but that one mistake could be fatal and it could be a cancer. So here is a picture of DNA and replication. It's really important to be able to label everything on this diagram and understand what it is. So remember, the order is important, we've already said. One strand can be read directly because it is a 5 to 3, and this is the leading strand. And then we have another strand which is read in the 3 to 5 direction, and this is the lagging strand. So this goes through DNA and replication, I recommend you spend a little bit of time on it um, by yourself. Essentially, this goes through it step by step, and this diagram here is exactly the same as the one I just showed you, but with slightly different animations. So we have steps 1 to 3 on this page. 4 and 5 here, 6 and 7 here, and then finally step 8. But overall you end up with two strands of DNA instead of the one that you started with. It's important to be aware of the enzymes that are involved, so helicases, primase, DNA polymerase and ligase, and the role that they play in replication, as this is easily tested in exams. And again we take a look at this diagram. So remember, DNA is a very long molecule, and to fit them into the nucleus, it must be condensed. So the double helix coils around what we call histones, and this forms beads on a string, and these beads are nucleosomes. And the nucleosomes coil into chromatin, which become your chromosome, and then this condenses into the nucleus uh, within the cell. So remember that diagram we saw at the start, how we're all human with cells, and then we have chromosomes and DNA. This shows the breakdown from chromosome down all the way to DNA level. And that's everything for this video. I hope you found it useful, and if you do have any questions, please feel free to contact me. And thank you for listening.